Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to review local anesthetics and muscle relaxants today. So it's gonna be a really quick review that hits the uh, key topics. So let's get started. So local anesthetics, um, I think we're all pretty familiar with, uh, particularly something like lidocaine, for example. Um, I think we've all had something done at the dentist's office. So they all end with cane and they can be divided into two uh, groups. So you have esters and you have amides. And what's really nice is, um, so I just wrote out the prefixes for all of these, but for the amides, you can remember them because there's an I in it and all of the uh, amides will have an I in the prefix. So of course they're all gonna have an I, an I because of the cane part, but for example, uh, ropivacaine has an I there, or lidocaine has an I here and here, but like I said, in the prefix part. So that's how you can remember which ones are amides, and esters um, won't have that second I, that prefix I, so that's great. Um, so esters are metabolized in the plasma, so that basically, will mean that they're a little more dangerous and that you can have a, an allergic reaction to them. Uh, mides are metabolized in the liver, so anything that messes with the liver um, should be considered with amides. So the way they work is basically they gain a proton and they, it's really simple, they gain a proton um, inside the cell and then they block the uh, sodium channel and then uh, they won't be able to send an action potential. So for example, let's say this is the drug, right? And when you inject it, um, it's, let's just say it's, it's pretty stable and it, it wants to get a proton. So um, extracellular, the pH is um, a little higher than intracellular. So it's going to go through that lipid bilayer, and then once it's in the cell, it's going to gain a proton, and now it's activated, and so it's going to go in here and just pretty much just plug it up. It's going to stop it, and then all of these uh, sodium ions cannot come in anymore, and then an action potential won't be propagated. So let's review what the what I wrote here. So again, uh, they work by gaining a proton, which means they're very very pH dependent. Um, when you inject Something like, for example, lidocaine, it can burn a little bit, so they are buffered to a neutral pH to reduce that burning, but that also increases the bioavailability, right? Because um, now they can uh, get into the cell and be activated there. So something else about, uh, let's see, them is that they work very quickly and they kind of want to go everywhere really fast. And so, uh, all of the um, local anesthetics cause vaso, don't cause vasoconstriction except for one. Um, so cocaine is considered a local anesthetic and that does uh, not, wait, cause vaso, cocaine causes hypertension, um, right? So this is wrong. Okay, here we go. So it's the only one that does cause vasoconstriction. Um, and so because of that, of course, cocaine, like I said, can give you hypertension, but the other ones are given with a tiny bit of epinephrine when they're injected. So that would cause the local areas to vasoconstrict. And so instead of the medicine kind of going everywhere, it stays a little more local and it lasts longer. So again, um, they're all given, not all, but they can be given with epinephrine to cause local basal constriction, which will help them last longer. And a side note, um, I'm not sure how true this is anymore, but I know that historically you're not supposed to give this uh, with epinephrine in the fingers, toes, penis, ears, nose, things like that, because it can cause um, some sort of ischemia in the end capillaries. So that's something to be considered. And then, uh, that's pretty much it. Like I said, they're really, really um, simple. Uh, it's really great. And something to be aware, some symptoms include sedation, restlessness, or seizures, particularly cocaine would cause seizures. I think we all know that though. And something just a little interesting is the natural local anesthetic is actually an 
chili pepper. So um, this is what makes things spicy, right? And they think it's because basically uh, when you put it on something local, like let's say your gums, um, it's such an intense reaction that it depletes your substance P and then it works for about four hours and it won't cause, or it'll cause you to feel a lot less pain than um, had you not eaten that chili pepper or put capsian. And um, that's something that's also in Icy Hot. So that is local anesthetics. And now we're gonna go over muscle relaxants. So, okay. Really quick before moving on, I just wanted to say that uh, muscle relaxants used to really, really confuse me. Um, so I've tried breaking this down as much as possible because I really feel like it is so simple and people really, really overcomplicate it. So, okay, let's go down here first. So you have muscle relaxants, right? They can be broken down into centrally acting and peripherally acting. Centrally acting will naturally work on the brain. Okay, so instead of working directly on the muscles and things like that, or in the neuromuscular junction, it's just gonna make your brain chill out and, and not really feel the pain of the spasm and just relax. Um, so peripherally acting, uh, these are a lot more serious because they work at the neuromuscular junction um, or directly on the muscle. And so because of these, we use these in surgeries. Um, they do not cross the blood brain barrier and they can be given with IV or injection. So, okay, so let's go to peripherally acting. So first up, we have non-depolarizing. So really great. There's a really easy way to remember which the, uh, what drugs these are, but I'm just going to explain a super simple concept. So here you have the neuromuscular junction, right? It's just where the nerve meets the muscle. And if we were to take this area and expand it, we see this, right? So here's the nerve terminal entering the, neuromus the muscular junction, hence the neuromuscular junction. So here we have a bunch of acetylcholine, these little uh, purple things, right? And they're gonna cross this and go to the, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So on the muscle. Um, so what can we do to make the muscle relax? Well, we can mess with this neuromuscular junction, right? So we have depolarizing and non-depolarizing. So non-depolarizing basically means that it's going to come here and just park its butt inside of the receptor. And so that's it. It's really easy. So it's just gonna be a fade. It's called um, fade, and you might see this in textbooks or on uh, quizzes, but it, it looks like this, okay? So that's just one phase, it's called the phase. Um, so that's really easy, right? And then depolarizing is going to cause something with, let's guess, something to do with depolarizing, right? So lucky for us, there's only one you really need to know, succinylcholine. Um, but this is how it's going to do it. So instead of just parking its butt and then not really uh, letting it do anything, it's going to annoy it. So it's just going to make it tired and you're going to get, basically it's just going to like make the muscle like freak out and then it's just going to stop. And so there's two phases. You have the constant phase, which these are all supposed to be the same height. And then you have the fade phase. So just like the second one, fade, fade. But this one you also have constant. So this one's two phases, constant, and then fade. And these just represent um, the, the muscle's uh, action potential. So naturally, what are going to be the side effects for these? You're going to get fasciculations. Uh, that makes sense, right? You're annoying it, so it's going to kind of twitch a lot. Uh, you're going to get hyperkalemia. Um, and this is especially true in patients who have had some sort of tissue damage or, or rhabdomyosis or burn patients. Um, why is this the case? So remember that every time there is a muscle action potential, it's going to release uh, potassium into the serum. And so if you're somebody already is pre uh, predisposed to that, um, they have had a lot of tissue damage and that can happen. 
Um, another one that's really important to be aware of is malignant hyperthermia. So uh, kind of the same thing, but basically it's going to be a massive calcium release instead. So three side effects, fasciculations, twitches, hyperkalemia, um, especially in burn patients, and malignant hyperthermia. So like I said, uh, there's a really easy way to remember which ones these are. So I'm not going to list them all, but the non-depolarizing ends in curium. And so since we're NDs, you can remember that NDs, non-depolarizing, cure, right? Curium, or you can remember that because this is basically competing with acetylcholine to park its butt here, uh, non-depolarizing uh, ones can be reversed with anything that increases acetylcholine, i.e. acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So these can be, so the non-depolarizing ones can be cured um, by giving acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, or you can remember that ND, ND's cure, so curium. Um, and then something else to be aware of in terms of side effects is there's a drug we don't really use anymore, but tubocurium uh, does cause a release of histamine in people, which can cause uh, lots of side effects. Just imagine a bunch of histamine going everywhere. So, yep, we have depolarizing succinylcholine, two phases. Great. And um, in terms of other ones that are peripherally acting, so we've done this, we've done this and this. Botox, just a really quick reminder, works directly by um, stopping the release of acetylcholine. And so we did that. And then at a direct acting one, is something called dantrolene, and that works directly inside of the muscle. So instead of parking its butt on the receptor, it's gonna go in the muscle, and it basically blocks calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's that in terms of peripherally acting. Okay, great. And oh, what's really great is, remember I said malignant hypothermia is because of a bunch of calcium release um, because of these uh, this constant phase. Right. Um, so basically, if somebody has malignant hypothermia, you can give dantrolene to counteract that because, like I said, it blocks calcium from being released from the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So great. See how easy that is? We're already done with half of them. Now, centrally acting, I'm actually not going to go super into it because you already know them. They work on the brain, gabapentin, diazepam. Uh, they Cause, can cause CNS depression. They basically reduce muscle tone, but they don't reduce power. First, like, if you get confused of that, think of something like Botox. If you get Botox, you won't be able to really furrow your brow anymore, for example, so you've lost power. But if I'm taking gabapentin, I can still go like this. It's totally fine. Um, so something to be aware. Like I said, they decrease pain, not decrease strength. Um, and one that is used, so most of them are used for like chronic pain, like think of people who take gabapentin, uh, like chronic pain patients. Um, that's something that is, they're gonna be on for a while chronically, but there is an acute one to be aware of, and that's cyclobenzaprim, and that's like your weakened warrior who needs to, um, who has like a painful spasm or something like that. So, that is pretty much it. Um, like I said, this really simple, quick overview. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to email me. Again, my name is Erica, and my email is e. I should probably write it, but it's um, e. Aranda at scnm. Edu. So, thanks, guys. Hope you have a great week.